Hello and welcome to uh, our Black History Season event. Um, we've got this event today with a conversation with Annie Price. Um, so a bit about myself, my name is Derek. Um, I work at DME as a Special Projects Officer looking into student engagement. And I'm also lucky enough to work on our Decolonizing DMU event. And today we have, as I said already, the wonderful Annie Price with us. Now, Annie has a, a wonderful story and a, a very powerful, inspirational story. Um, Annie is a TV presenter. Um, she's a fitness trainer and she is also a mother. Um, before today, from what Annie, I thought she was a mother of one, but I found out she's a mother of two. So Annie has got a lot going on as well. Um, you may recognize her as well from a lot of things that has been on TV, uh, particularly on BBC Three. So Annie started doing a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, TV appearances in these shows back in 2016. Now, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if you've come across Annie before, but if you haven't, I, I assure you that today will be a, 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 a wonderful conversation that you learn a lot from. And I'm willing that, and I hope that I can learn a lot from her story as well. So without wasting any more time, I'm gonna invite Annie to join, uh, to, to join me on here for our conversation today. Hello, Annie. Hello, how are you? Not too bad, not too bad, thank you. Good to, good to see you again. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna disappear, you know, today's my about me, so I'm gonna disappear and give you the platform. Perfect, um, thank you very much. Hi guys, thank you very, very much for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. I hope you've had a great day so far and your black history season has been very helpful and eye-opening. I'm here today, as Derek said, to chat with you about my story. I'm gonna tell you what happened to my face, how, why, what it meant to me, what it means to me now, and some of the things that I've gone through and some of the things that I've learned along the way to deal with the many challenges and frustrations that we all go through from time to time. And I'm hoping that it will really impact you enough that maybe you'll use them, maybe it will help you in some way. Um, <clears throat> I'll start at the beginning, because that's what always makes sense. As you can see from the picture, I was burning in a fire, very, very young. I was only four weeks old there. I was born into a traveller family. <clears throat> Not sure if many of you know much about travellers and gypsies. They're quite a nomadic bunch, move around a lot, quite patriarchal. Certainly it was for me when I grew up. My The man usually goes out to earn the money. The women usually stay at home and, and look after the kids. Quite often, the they'll have kids quite young. And that was true for my mum. My mum was white. Her husband was also white. So when I came out black, it put her in a very, very difficult situation. The story that I was told was that my mum put me in a caravan and set light to it, which isn't nice for anyone to think that that's how they grew up. I was also told that <clears throat> someone saw her do this and then they decided to rescue me. They took me out of the fire and they took me straight to hospital. I've never held any anger or resentment towards my mum. I've always thought that any normal happy person wouldn't do that. You know, no one would intentionally want to hurt a baby. I thought, God, you know, what kind of life must she have had to think that that's okay, to think that's an option? So we just felt really sad for her, and I just thought, God, what's her experiences and who she had around her? It's always felt really bad. But when I used to tell people about my story, everyone would always be very angry and annoyed and really aggressive and say, there's some things that are completely unforgivable. And so it always got me thinking about forgiveness and how I felt about that. And for me, I've always, always reasoned that forgiveness is something that actually shouldn't be held back and it shouldn't be used in some kind of miraculous way, um, but something that we do daily and we get used to doing from as early an age as possible, like cleaning your teeth or making your bed. It should be something that we can hand out as easy as, as we can. 
it's what the world, you know, what the, we need to keep the world turning. For me personally, I wouldn't have done half the things I've done if people hadn't given me the benefit of the doubt to do so and given me a little bit of forgiveness. And regards to my mum, if I hadn't forgiven her and decided to pick up hate and anger, that's how I would have lived. But what kind of life would that have been, you know, to be angry and bitter? What a waste of life. What a complete waste of life. It would have been no point in that person saving me at all. I was in hospital for about six or seven months where I had well over several dozen different operations, most of them to save my life, but a lot of them to try and make me look as normal as possible. I suffered third degree burns and over 60% of my body, which as a baby is quite a lot. Obviously it's different as you, as you become an adult. So I've got burns on my face, the top of my head. I always wear a wig both my hands, my arm, and I've lost a finger. Race has always been uh, quite a big part of my story. My mum didn't want me partly because of my race. The community didn't want me. My mum filed for adoption twice before I was born <clears throat> on the grounds that we, I would be she and I would both be ostracized from the community as the community wouldn't want a mixed race child. So it's always been something that's been a part of my life concerning about my race. But in all honesty, I've had so many different issues growing up. You know, I've been um, in and out of hospital most of my life. I had to battle with how people take me, how people stare at me, how their reactions, how I deal with myself. <clears throat> I was fostered, adopted. So it kind of put the race card as a drop in the ocean and it kind of rendered it obsolete. I was very lucky. I was fostered by a wonderful family and later adopted by the same family. Now, I feel very lucky here because I know a lot of people that were fostered and later stayed in the foster community and got bounced around loads of different homes and didn't manage to get adopted at all. So the fact that I was fostered and adopted by the same family, I feel very, very, very grateful for. The family that adopted me were all white. So that was another interesting fact, a part of my story in that it took them six whole years to actually finally be able to keep me. Because back then, 30 years ago, they didn't like interracial adoption. So as I say, I didn't feel that my race was such a big problem because I had so many different issues to work with at the time. And I was very lucky. My mum approached difference in a really open and honest way and saw it more as something new than something to be fearful of. She came at it with curiosity. Because there wasn't many books and stories and TV shows with people that looked like myself growing up. She made a huge effort to make sure she took me shopping in areas with other people that were black and mixed race, got me um, mixing with other travelers. She bought books and toys and put me in front of TV shows showing different um, races of people to try and make me feel a little bit more at home. She tried to make my normal, if you like, normal and not something to be scared of. And I think it's this attitude that carried me through school you know I felt very grateful for the start in life that I had and so when I started school I felt grateful and excited about it it was everyone else around me that was that would say Annie you know you're probably going to be bullied it's going to be really difficult for you people are going to call you names they're going to pick on you it's going to be hard it's going to be such a challenge and I just thought god you know I'm just really excited about starting school, making new friends, doing the sports that I love, English, I wanted to be a journalist, I thought, you know, this is brilliant. And this is the first time that I really realised that there's always more than one way to look at a situation. And really it comes down to our own experiences and our level of perception. I'm not crazy, I was excited about school, but I knew it was going to be a little bit difficult. And I don't think any of us escaped that, you know, at school, uni, any, any place, workplace, we're always going to have some level of difficulty at some point and I certainly didn't escape that I got called a few names here and there but nothing that wasn't manageable I think that's because I always reason that we're all different 
you know, look around the room that you're in. I'm sure there's <clears throat> hundred different types of people. You know, you've got tall people, short, young, old, rich, poor, smart, dark hair, blonde hair, red hair. Everyone's different. So growing up, I just thought, well, you know, why should I feel like I don't need to feel different too? Sure, I did get some trouble, you know, little things. People would call me names on the street, even I get some difficulties. Or even if I went into a coffee shop, <clears throat> I'd order a cup of tea or coffee and whoever I was with, the waitress would address and say, you know, what would she like? Would she like sugar? I think for a long time in my life, people thought I had some sort of um, mental problem as well. I don't think anything was too difficult for me until I got to about 15 or 16. I wanted to have a job and a bit of cash like everyone else. And all my friends were getting jobs in shops, like warehouse, top shop, you know, like the normal places. And I wanted to have a job too. So I thought, right, get my CV, type it out, email it off to people, take it into a shop. Brilliant. As I did. Now, I didn't get one call back from any of the jobs, any of the places that I handed this in. If I emailed it, I got a call back for an interview. I went, smiled, my new little fancy outfit. But the um, the shopkeeper, the interviewer would always be, feel really uncomfortable, would look at me, not sure. You know, the interview wouldn't last very long. It would be very rushed. I felt uncomfortable because of this. And the whole thing just unraveled in a really awkward kind of way. Now, I could quite easily say, the world's out to get me, everything's really hard. And I did feel bad. There was a point where this really did make me feel awful. You know, I thought, God, if I can't get a job in a shop, what else can I do? You know, can I make more friends? Can I ever ha get the job that I actually really want? Can I be in a relationship? You know, this is the first kind of time that I thought, God, this is really going to put a spanner in my life and how I live. You know, this is actually a problem, not just how I perceive myself and how I feel about my scars, but how other people look at me and treat me. You know, I don't want to wait for people to catch up all the time. I want to be able to take care of myself and live a full life. So I did for a short amount of time, spiral if you like, and feel very negative and get really sad. Normal feelings when you're knocked. But after a while, um, after realizing, you know, that, no matter whose fault it is or what the reasons are or how fair it is. That was my favorite line at the time. This is so unfair. I realized that I was going to have to take responsibility for the situation. That's what responsibility is, I think. It's how we respond. So it's our response and we get to choose that. And looking back on those interviews at the start, there's a thousand things I could have done to make that a lot better. You know, I could have put my best foot forward. I could have gone there with a little bit more charm, a little more charisma. I could have really pumped on my CV. I could have gone back a couple of times. I could have explained the situation or asked them outright, you know, is there a problem? Is there something I can reassure you with? Sure, it's a little bit more weight on my shoulders, but that's part of my life and how I'm going to have to live it. So there's loads of things I could have done. But I don't think that this is necessarily a bad thing, having these times. I think that, <clears throat> you know, these sort of difficult situations, these painful times, really breeze what true contentment, joy, growth, you know, becoming an adult really is. And all the feelings that comes with it. You know, feeling angry, which I did at some points, feeling frustrated, sad, upset unsure, scared, and anxious, a big word that gets thrown around so much, I think, at the moment. These are all really, really reasonable feelings. You know, the pain is there for a reason. You know, it's telling us something that's not okay. And if we can work through it and function with this adversity, that's how we learn to become a little bit more and grow a little bit more as a person. So these sort of pains, if we can manage them just for a little bit, lean into them if you like and pause, 
we can start asking ourselves the bigger questions like what do we really want and that's what it gives us that little awkward feeling because quite often we're so caught up with what our friends think what our teachers think what our parents think what society thinks you know what does society deem appropriate that we forget about what we want but when you go through difficult times certainly true for me I suddenly was able to say okay right what's actually needed here what do I what do I need to feel good how do I want to feel what do I want to do what are the next steps and that was literally what was going through my head then I thought right what's the next steps to me how do I want to feel because I'd love to say oh, I had a really big epiphany and everything worked out and it went wonderfully well but it didn't happen like that at all for me I just got bored you know I just got bored of feeling bad I didn't like being negative I was a really happy person I was very social I loved going out with my friends hanging out being with other people I didn't want to be sad and angry. It wasn't a place I ever wanted to be. And so I thought, right, how do I want to feel? I want to feel good. There must be some small way I can feel a little bit better. And for me, it was all about work. I thought, right, I really want to get a job. I want to be able to take care of myself. And I did. I started getting active, proactive, and started thinking about ways to change my situation. This was another big point for me. All these things kind of happen at the same kind of time. I realized that, no matter how bad a situation is, there's always a way you can make it a little bit better. And that's all you need, just to make it a tiny bit better. You don't have to completely 360 it and make it perfect, but just to improve the situation, just a tiny amount can really get the ball rolling. And for me, I thought, right, I want to work for myself. I don't want to <clears throat> wait for people to catch up and be okay with how I look and be comfortable with me being in their workplace. So I thought, right, what can I do? How can I add value? How can I work? Now, I'd always done sport. I did gymnastics, trampolining, athletics uh, for years during my childhood and a little bit in my teens. And I had to do a lot of training in a gym to support the sports. So I thought, right, I'm comfortable in that area. I'll, I think I'm going to be a personal trainer. I'll, I'll take a personal training course. So I did. Saved my pennies, took the course, found a gym space to rent out. I started working for myself and it was wonderful. It really, really lifted me up. And I realized then that picking up these little challenges, and I'm not talking about the big challenges that you get thrust upon you, like how I look or dealing with people's reactions, these things that I must manage out of <clears throat> just to live. I'm talking about picking up these challenges and deciding I'm going to do this thing. That alone, whether I succeeded or failed, made me feel good. So as soon as I started the job, I felt good. I say I'm laughing because, or giggling to myself, because when I started my first gym, I was one of about 12 trainers. They were about 10 of them were men, like 100 kilo big rugby boys. And then there was <clears throat> a couple of five foot 10 Australian girls, very lovely, all very kind, but very athletic. And then I was this tiny, very skinny little five foot four trainer trying to drum up business with my nine fingers. I got a hell of a lot of nose and a lot of not nice nose as well. So I had to really learn how to deal with other people's reactions to me front on in the workplace. I had to deal with <clears throat> putting myself forward and backing myself, really, which really, really helped me at the time. Um, <clears throat> and it did go well. After a while, I managed to drum up my business. And it helped me to realise as well that if you're going through a difficult time, there's always a way to feel good in that reaching out and helping other people because that's what personal training is really it certainly was for me all I was trying to do is get people to look cute in a pair of jeans <clears throat> balance their lifestyle or feel good for a few hours and me getting to focus on them and their goals helped me do that now I'm in quite a aesthetic kind of career and so a lot of people always ask me about body positivity and how I dealt with that and how I was really upset about how I looked and about <clears throat> my color and about adoption and all these different issues that have popped up over my over the years <clears throat> but in all honesty <clears throat> particularly the body positivity and how I looked <clears throat> I didn't have time to be upset you know I was 18, 19, I'd moved out of home quite early. I had to keep a roof over my head. <clears throat> I didn't have time to be worried about how I looked and how people perceived how I looked. I just needed to do the job. So half the time when we're worried about this, these issues of how we look, 
in reality, if we can pick up a responsibility or focus on other values like working hard, perseverance, our intelligence, our goals, the things that we want to get out of life, it becomes really unimportant about how we look and how other people view us. Another nice lesson for me. Um, so I was in a gym for quite a while, drumming up a lot of business. I'm sure a lot of you know personal trainers sort of trained in a gym. Uh, we like to often overtrain lots of people and just have lots of people under our belt. And so after a while, I realized this isn't going to work for me. I need another way. <clears throat> so me and my husband or my boyfriend at the time decided that we wanted to open our own gym. Now, we didn't want all the money in one pot. So I stayed in the city for a little bit. And my, my boyfriend went off with another guy and opened a gym in Cobham. When it started running well enough as it doing well, then I left and I joined them. And for a couple of years, we focused on this space. And we wanted to do group training and focus all on having an atmosphere of hard work, results and community. And we did that. And it was wonderful. And I absolutely loved it. And it really gave me focus and value and really picked up my self-esteem. And I think because of this, I had this nice job that I was enjoying. I had a really good relationship. And I'm not just talking about like a love relationship. I'm talking about friendships as well. I had a nice little setup. I'd create this lovely little bubble for myself, which I didn't really have. Because I say I moved out quite young and I was running around, had a hundred different things going on. I think this bubble, if you like, safety bubble, made me feel very comfortable <clears throat> and allowed me to start relaxing and then looking back on my past and on the things that happened in my childhood and what happened on the day of the fire. Do I have family? I had a lot of questions that I'd never really picked up before because I'd always felt like I didn't have anger towards my mum, but I didn't necessarily want to meet her or be with her or, you know, she didn't want me. I don't want you know, I've got my own life, I've got my own family, I don't need to be with her. But as I was approaching a certain age and thinking about having my own kids, I thought, if I don't do this now, it might not happen. So I started looking back and I did what any normal person would do, got on Facebook, little Google search, tried loads of names, and I found out loads of travellers basically have the same bloody, have the same name. So uh, it was very, very difficult. Now, at the same time, my husband was training um, a couple of the England team and they had agents. And one of the agents said, Annie, love to meet you. If you um, ever thought about doing TV, will you come and meet some production companies with me? <clears throat> and at the time, I thought, no, I hadn't ever thought about being on TV, but I'm not the sort of person to say no to the opportunity. So I thought, fantastic, I'll go. I'll go along, I'll have a little look, see what it's about. Now, they tried to get me to do a few documentaries that kind of, I want to say glamorise, but it's not the right word, kind of, you know, glamorise in a negative way how I looked. And it was all about my face and sort of not very nice empowering ideas. So I didn't, I didn't want to do it. And I almost let it drop. But then they came to me and said, Annie, would you like to find out about your past? How about we look into what happened on the day of the fire? What actually happened? Who was there? If we could find out who saved you, if you have family. And I thought, this is perfect. This is brilliant. This is going to make my job a lot easier. You know, I have the backing of the BBC to help me, see me through this journey, if you like. Because I knew that beyond the money and the support, it was more having a team around me to see it through. Because no matter what happens, when something's difficult, there's times that you will want to pause and pull back. So I was. I want to say excited, I was nervous, but I was glad that I got to do this with them. So we did, we started filming with the goal, the sole goal of finding out what happened on the day, if I have family, who saved me, and if it was really my mum that that caused the fire. Um, I was very lucky. I found out I do have family. I have a brother and sister. I found out that my mum didn't intentionally try to kill me although it was very dubious and there was neglect there it wasn't a happy ending but it was a nicer ending than I thought and I got to meet a fireman that was there on the day who was wonderful and kind and we're actually still in touch now um 
so no, it was a really, really eye-opening experience, mainly because I never believed I'd find any of that information out at all. So it was huge for me to really sort of feel a real life miracle in that <clears throat> I got to find out things that I never thought possible. And it also introduced me into the power of TV because very naughty me, I shouldn't say this. I wasn't really into TV that much before. I was kind of more of a music girl. But I realized how important it is and how much it can do for people. So when the BBC asked me to come back and work with them again and make some more documentaries, I thought, fantastic. I would, you know, I'd love to do this. And I jumped to the chance. Um, <clears throat> I got to make four more documentaries with them. And I've just currently filming a little mini series for socials at the moment for them. So I was able to really do the do the journalistic job that I originally wanted to do that I didn't think was possible when I when I got my um, confidence knock. So it's quite special to me that I got to do that. Now, <clears throat> my story, I think from the outside looking in, a lot of people think that it's, you know, probably full of anger and hate and difficulty and hard times. <clears throat> But for me, it couldn't be further from the truth. I think that my life has worked out the way it has through love. You know, I think it's the positive person that saves a baby from a fire, that takes them to hospital. It's a positive person that wants to be a fireman and look after people, to be a nurse, to be a doctor. It's a positive person that decides to operate on a child that they've been told is more than likely to gonna die and just to make her comfortable and leave her to it. It's a positive person that wants to keep doing that. It's a positive person that decides to foster, that wants to adopt another child and treat them as their own. It's also a positive person that wants to call up their friend and check in on them and see if they're okay. I feel like everything I've done is because of other people being kind and positive towards me. And so I really want to drill home that positivity, whilst we all kind of hashtag roll our eyes, it's so overused at the moment. Being positive doesn't just impact your life, it will impact the lives of every single person around you. Right, guys, I'm going to have a very quick drink of water and then I'm going to have a very quick chat about five very small points of things that I do to have kind of like a full happy life, if you like. I really hope you can't hear my baby upstairs. Don't worry, my husband's with him, I'm not. Okay, so. Uh, my my five little points. I'm going to start with positivity. Please don't roll your eyes. And I've probably said it about 10 times in the last three minutes. And I know that it's very much overused, but it really is so important. Um, I do want to separate the fact that I don't think positivity is that person that's running around <clears throat> happy-go-lucky, always on a smile on, this, on their face. That's a good mood. That's something else. Still lovely, but it's something else. Positivity is a decision. You know, and we can call it what we want. We could call it faith. We could call it religion, uh, mental attitude. We could call it focus. But whatever you call it, it is something that we do. We have to actively do. We are positive. You know, we try to actively see a situation as it is. And at best, as best it can be. And that's something that we must do. My second point is because when I've been in difficult situations and people have you know tried to encourage me and to get me to be positive <clears throat> and I wanted to tell them to leave me alone I thought how do you get how do you get to positive how can you get to positive when everything's hard or everything's difficult you're in a difficult spot and so for my 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 point here is to try and be grateful or appreciative of the small things this is such a huge thing and have a massive dent in our whole view. It will really change our whole perspective. 
if we start noting the positive things or the things that we're grateful for throughout the day. And you can do that before bed. You can list, you know, five to ten things that you're grateful for from the day. Or in the morning, you could say from the day before. But the more we do this, the more we'll keep doing it. And it will slowly change the whole perspective. It's such a small thing with such a big influence over our whole lives. My next thing is challenges. Challenges, and not just the challenges outside, you know, the things that we have to deal with, the pains that we have to get through, but talking about inside, you know, what, how are we acting, how are we behaving? No matter how well we live, there's quite often a little bit more we can do. You know, did you like the way you spoke to that person? Did you like the way you acted? Did you like who you were on this occasion? Even with the Black Lives Matter quite recently, I've noted that for me personally, I've never really wanted to overshare my story. You know, I felt like I don't want to be that poster girl, that burnt girl flying the flag all the time. I always felt that the best form of... <clears throat> demonstration is to live boldly and compassionately and live a full life in that way but actually in hindsight after the last few months I've realized that that's not enough you know I'd love this world to be more diverse I'd like people to be a bit more accepting and how can we do that if people don't understand my story is pretty rare you know I'm a black very strange uh, mixed heritage Gypsy, traveller, English, Irish. I need to share these stories. My stories on adoption. My stories on parenting. Being a face of uh, parents of mixed relationships, of having a happy life with scars. Sometimes what we think we need to do is point the finger at other people all the time but quite often actually it's about putting ourselves forward now sure we can say it's our, maybe it's not our job to educate people and that would be lovely but in reality if I hadn't stopped to help people understand my situation I wouldn't be nearly as happy as I am today so I'd really encourage people in whatever whatever stance you're, you're you take everything on to try and be a little bit more open-minded and a little bit more compassionate towards other people to help if people ask, allow them to ask questions. And try and note what more you can do on a personal level. It's these small changes that are going to rack up way more than the massive changes that people do once in a blue moon. My next thing is, I call it be still. It's definitely my form of meditation. I took a meditation class quite a while ago. I basically kept falling asleep and the lady demoted me and made me meditate my eyes open. So that doesn't work for me. But for me, this be still is my form of meditation. What I do is get my phone, set a timer for 10 minutes. I literally had to start about three minutes, but now I do 10 minutes. And in those 10 minutes, I can't do anything. So if I'm watching the TV, fine, enjoy that TV. But I can't jump up, make food, make a cup of tea, get on the phone, check Instagram, which I do too much. I'm always on there, always on my phone. I've just got to stop and relax. And it just teaches me that there's not a lot I can do about my initial reaction. You know, that's just going to come up, you know. But just pausing allowed me to create a space between my reaction and my response. And that's not what we can change. I always believe when people say be calm in every situation, I think it's ridiculous. You know, whatever you're going to do, you're going to do. You're going to feel how you feel. But if we can try and learn to control our response, that's where we've got a little bit of power. And a little bit of control. Um, <clears throat> and my last little point is to remember, because right now there's so much going on, you know, in the world and at home, at school, at the community, with family, with friends. There's so much going on. I think so busy. We've got so much social media. There's so much coming in all the time at us that quite often we kind of get a little bit lost but to remember that we're in control here you know we get to decide what we read in who are we listening to who are our friends 
Who are we going to be in relationships with? What kind of job are we going to have? What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Are we going to drink? Are we going to go out? Are we going to stay in? Are we going to take care of ourselves? Who are we going to follow on Instagram? Who are we going to be buying from? Where are we going to be spending our money? How are we going to be spending our money? These are all our decisions. And just to remember that above everything, everyone around you, you are your biggest impact. You know, you get to decide what happens in your life. And that's where your power is. And that's how you can create all the changes that you want. Thank you very much, guys. I really, really hope you enjoyed my talk. It's a nice, surreal experience. I feel like I've just um, chatted to myself. So I really hope there's you've enjoyed it. I'm really open to questions. So please ask anything you like. Um, I'll be quite intrigued. So please ask away. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the tremendous story, um, Annie. It's, it's, uh, I've, I've got here just scribbling things. There's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to take from this. Oh, um, I'm, really um, glad. I'm really glad. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to take from this. While we wait for any more comments, uh, uh, questions to come in, um, I just thought I'm going to throw some questions and, you know, ask, you know, Please. a little things about different points through, through, through your, your story. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, at DMU, we're doing a lot of work on on you know decolonizing and 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 we talk about privilege in a lot of different ways. Um, um, but a lot of the time, we focus our, our privilege around race, you know. But from your story, you know, you've mentioned many elements of privilege. You know, for example, you know, the traveler background. You mentioned yeah. having different national backgrounds. Also, got the the race element to your story as well. You know, so so you know sometimes all these things lead to different forms of of uh, lack of opportunities in a lot of different ways. And yeah. from your story, you, you had a lot of confidence you know, in yourself and, you know, that, you know, to, to just, although those moments came, you overcame them, you know, and you got through it. So yeah. how, how did you develop that confidence and, and what strategies did you use? You know, did, did these five points, you know, I'm sure you kind of developed this as you went through your journey, but what was there in the initial, what, what kind of kept you going on? Kept me going on. Um, I think, it's to realize as well, when you hear someone's story as a whole, it always sounds a little bit more like, oh, you know, she's really overcome these different things. Mm. But in reality, for me, everything was so small. And I always say this, this is what I meant when I said about, you know, pain and difficulty really is part of life. And we need to accept it and kind of lean into it. Because that's what happens before a challenge. You're, you feel anxious, you feel anxiety, you feel scared. Mm. Um, and for me, I, I experienced that so many times as a kid that by the time it got to the bigger things, it was easier to manage. So it wasn't that I felt like I really had to overcome things, in all honesty. It was that these things came up and I had to overcome them, you know? Like, mm -hmm. occasionally when I was young, I remember as well, like, I've got my makeup on, I've got my hair on, I've probably got enough makeup on to paint the face of everyone in the room at the moment. But um, I, I didn't always wear makeup. I didn't even wear a wig till I was about 20, if you can believe it. Wow. Um, mm. So I did look a lot more severe and like people stared mm. at me a lot more. When I was younger, I didn't want to go out sometimes, you know, I get bored and I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to be stared at today, you know? Um, but my mum would be very much like, Annie, you know, if you don't want to, if you don't want to, you know, if you want to have that food or you want to go out, you've got to go and get it yourself. You can't hide from it. So I was really lucky. I had a lot of people that were kind of pushing yeah. me slash encouraging me to get on with those things. And also, I knew from an early age, quite quickly, it was either, it was the bigger decisions that were the easy ones. When you get a big challenge, mm. it's easier. It's the little decisions. It's all those small decisions, like what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What time am I going to get up in the morning? They're the little ones that are more difficult because they're easier to get wrong and it's not got a big impact in your life. But the no. big decisions, like for me, am I going to go out or not? If I don't go out, I'm going to have a bit crap, crappy afternoon sitting on my own. It's mm. quite easy. You're going to have to go out and have a good life. You know, do I want to wait for people to catch up to get a job? Not really. Okay, so you're going to have to then work for yourself. So for me, it's actually realizing that the big decisions are a bit of a blessing. They free yeah, us and make yeah. us make our thinking really clear and makes a decision really easy. But the key bit is to learn to lean into that. So when you're nervous, mm. or something big happens, try not to run away. And by run away, what I mean is go out and drink three bottles of wine with your friends 
or hide, you know, try and just yeah. take that time to be at home, get your notebook out and think, right, how can I tackle this? What's the outcome of going this way or going that way? And you'll find, honestly, it's a lot easier. And as soon as you start mm. breaking it down, it is more manageable. It's always when it mm. first happens, that initial response isn't always good. You know, we're very, very <laughs> naturally into the survival mode. So we naturally want to yeah, pull back. Yeah, yeah. So That's right. you, yeah, you know, so if you can deal with that and let that slide, give yourself a moment, come at it again, it's a lot easier to manage. And I, and I do believe a lot of us can do a lot more with that kind of thinking. Including myself, yeah. I need to be there. <laughs> yeah, fantastic, fantastic. I mean, c c coming off that, um, um, you kind of spoke about your mom, you know, and I'm, I'm guessing from your story, she was quite instrumental in in helping you to develop some of that confidence from what you just said. Did she? Did you guys ever talk about the racial side of things um, um, growing up? You know, you yeah. talked about how she would take you to spaces with more black people there, so you could see people like you. So that representation, she really did make a, a point to. Yeah make you get access to that? Did you guys talk about that? And how did she get to that point of understanding that representation was important? Yeah, so it was it was quite a constant thing, the race conversation. I've got a horrible yeah, yeah. state that my whole adoptive family is white. Did I did I say that? No, I did, didn't I? No, yeah, 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 you did. You mentioned that they are white, yeah, 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 adoptive yeah, family. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, it was a constant thing. Obviously, you know, in the family pictures, everyone's white and there's me, black, mm. I've got a straight mm. wig with my afro out it was quite glaringly obvious that you know i stuck out for different reasons and she wanted me to fit in um mm. i she, we would always have conversations about it namely because she had to i'll tell you a quick funny story so my mum would take me out and about and she would sort of say you know my dad would have looked like this kind of man you know to give an example obviously as a three-year-old when i was out you know curled up on my mum's hip I'd point at a black man and say, Mum, is that my dad? Obviously, my mum would oh, want to wow. be like, Annie, please, you know, you're making me look. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so the conversation was always there, but it was good. It wasn't, obviously, she didn't always get met with the nicest questions from me, but she made it really yeah. open to do it. But what she did was she included everything. It's the same what I'm going to do with my kids because I found a lot of the storybooks Mm. don't tend to have a lot of black faces on there now my mm -hmm. kids are, my husband's quite he's south african he's quite light skinned so my kids are really almost white um really yeah, yeah, yeah. But i want them to see black faces so this is what i mean yeah, about yeah. You know, is there more we can do yeah they'll be fine seeing other white faces but i don't want them that's to right so i'm going to include these books i'm going to include tv shows i'm going to make sure they you know we're socializing with people you know my friends yeah. black, they'll see more more people so i think it's just about being open to the conversation not shying away from it and, and yeah. uh, acting accordingly but no my mum was always really open with with everything yeah that's that, that's that's amazing to hear and it kind of almost replicates i guess what you know we're talking about in the gender against race and how do we fight it that you kind of need people around you to also understand you know your scenario and i find it amazing that your mum was you know without any books at the time and with a lot of a lot of you know information out there she still knew you know what this is important for my daughter and i'm going to find a yeah. way to get it done so you must have an allyship in your mom that you know yeah. we're trying to i guess as an institute at the end we're trying to yeah. how do we get more people as allies behind this yeah um, um i'll say one know, this, this, yeah now i was gonna say one quick thing she one of the best things with her as well it wasn't just for me like her she had two children that she'd had naturally herself they were mm -hmm. white and um you know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm just going to go to the shop because Annie's on board. You know, if mm -hmm. I wasn't there, mm -hmm. I'd be called off to these different places. You know, whether I was at my friends or not, she was still cooking Jamaican food. She was still, you know, watching shows about travellers. It was it was part of the whole household, so I didn't feel special. So I always sort of try and say to people, if you're trying to incorporate the new, try and make the new normal rather than make it a special mm -hmm. thing. Try and get yeah, it yeah, yeah. part of your life. That's right. That's right. Very well put. Um, so I guess, you know, for some of the students watching, um, um, I know from working with a lot of students, a, a lot of time, confidence and, and fear is a big thing for students. They fear to go and do, to go and do that thing they don't understand. And you spoke of how, you know, you, you know, again, involved in sports of overcoming that fear to build that confidence. Um, so I just want to ask, what, what, what was it like, you know, with your friends at, through your education, you know, you said you kind of did hear a few comments, but I'm sure those were hard days to overcome. You know, so what, would, what advice would you give to any student watching this who's like, you know what, I also need to overcome my fear and put myself in the places I want to be and conquer my fear to do what I want, uh, I want to do? What would you tell them? Um, 
is this fear about doing something or is this fear about people kind of being mean? I think both. So is the, is the end result of fear? Because a lot of students either have fear of going there because they're going to be the only one, fear oh, yeah. of trying that thing because, well, what if I fail? You know, fear of, I don't want to speak to that lecturer because if I ask a question, everyone laughs at me. So you know, that kind of fear of to do or to stay away from both of them. Yeah. yeah, no, I understand. Um, I think the first thing is to accept the situation. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think most of the time we shy away from how we feel and then that makes yeah. everything harder you know and you're scared and you're like oh yeah i'm not scared and you suddenly be a little bit ballsy yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, and yeah. Like, why have i done that i've just dug myself a hole now i can't be nervous and new and treat it you know i've got to be billy big wallocks all the time yeah. um so <laughs> i um, i i always say try and accept where you are that mm. makes everything a little bit easier to manage and then to not make not necessarily make the biggest jump forward, but just a small step forward, depending on how you feel. And to mm. remember as well, that's life. You know, yeah, we fail, yeah, we get yeah. up, we fail, we get up. I think all too often we think that failing is the opposite of success, and we think they're two ends of the same it's spectrum. spectrum. Yeah, yeah. But it's not. It's 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 the same thing. Like you literally cannot do anything without getting it wrong, and then making it a little yeah. bit. You know, so it's just yeah, getting yeah, used to yeah. that. try and accept it, and then it's easier to go. Okay, I'm gonna I'll accept that I'm nervous, but you know what? I'm actually about to do something I've never done before. Yeah, Does that what makes sense that I'm nervous. I think so. Yes. So you know, try and do it in that way. But fear in the way that we talk about people and how mm. you're getting called names. I think that's a kind of a different thing, only because that can be quite hard. In that sometimes. Mm. You like, I mean, I don't know if someone's been bullied or if they got a lot to manage. I certainly occasionally would just be like, you know, what, I I need a break. Like, I need I need to stay in and look after myself. Um, you know, I wasn't someone that was always going to say yes to going out with my friends if I had a time that something hurt me and upset me. I would be like, no, I don't feel good today. I want to go home. Mm -hmm. Obviously, self care wasn't a thing back then, but for me, I felt like. Um, I understood that feeling bad was okay. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the trouble comes when people have something happen and then suddenly try and <clears throat> bounce back. Yeah. You know? Whereas I think something bad happens, let yourself be sad. Let yourself sit in that moment. Don't rush your way through it. Yeah. 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 I mean, just I mean, coming off that, when was the first time you became conscious that you were different um i don't know if that makes sense no it makes perfect sense yeah 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 I'm gonna say the first thing that popped into my head but i don't know necessarily w when i was in play school so before even mm. nursery i think it's like play school yeah, yeah, i don't yeah. really remember this but I, I don't know if it's half memory half someone telling me but basically <laughs> i was in play school i know but i was in play school and um there was a mum with her child and she basically went to the teacher and said, that child, me, is scaring my kid. Yeah. Can you ask her to leave? You know, I want her out. Now, this is when my mum first realised, you know, oh, God, we're in a bit of a privilege. Just, you mm, know, mm, mm, mm. that's really inappropriate. Now, luckily for us, the teacher just said, absolutely not. Now you've got to leave. And she got this, kicked this lady out. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, I, I didn't, I didn't. I just knew of a difficult time at that point. As a very yeah. early memory, but I just remember it being a difficult time. Um, and then also when I approached school, I remember people were being flustered around in me. You know, like oh, you know, this is going to be a thing. And yeah. at the time, a very long part of part of my childhood, I had social workers because I was officially still a child of the state. I didn't belong yeah. to anyone yeah. right? So um, I had social workers, and they would always try and make me have conversations with other people that were burnt or have conversations about everything mm. and so I think mm. I first realized that I was different then and just generally when I go out like there's no way for me to hide it I mean I still look different now but I look you know I always look, I get stared at now but I got stared at loads when I was younger yeah, and people yeah, always yeah. ask you know you'd think that people wouldn't ask a child but you know adults would always come up to me and say oh, what happened to your face so I constantly mm. had people talking to me and so I noticed that my brothers and sisters didn't have the same attention yeah, but yeah, the only yeah. thing is because I was so young, I kind of thought it was normal. You know, that's what happens with kids. You know, they're very, very resilient. 
and I kind of yeah. expected it. Um, but no, I knew I was different from a from a. Mm -hmm. And, and were there, who were your, key, let's say, key role models growing up? Do you have any that you kind of um, um, inspirational models that you sat ahead of you or looked up to or took inspiration from? Oh, that's such not. I love, I love that question. Do you know what? In all, in all honesty, um, it sounds mildly conceited, and it's not at all, like at all. But I just didn't. There wasn't people that I could look up to that yeah, would directly yeah, affect. Yeah me but this is who I, but I did have role models and I'll tell you who they are but you're going to laugh at me but I'm just going to be honest I really loved Arnold Schwarzenegger he's achieved so much you know he's come from Austria and he's done all these things yeah. he wants to be a movie star and he's done it um mm -hmm. I, I really loved him and so I I now even maintain that you don't need to have someone that looks and, and talks and walks exactly okay. like and inspiration because to be honest with you in my lifetime i don't believe i'm gonna have loads of people that i can look up to mm -hmm. like there's katie piper there's simon weston there's a few people there's Tyria pitt that i know that are burnt and that have gone through different challenges but you know they're all they're all white number one mm -hmm. they're yeah, all yeah. Friendly. they've all grown up with more privileged upbringing than i have i was very yeah. working class, you know and they're not mixed mm -hmm. heritage they weren't adopted as well you know so there's I'm really going to find someone that I can completely look up to. So I think that whilst I love that we're trying to make the whole world more diverse, and I do that, mm. but I not, you know, I'm not sure how diverse it is, just having different colours on screen. But um, I do think that take take what you can from anywhere. You know, always look. Mm. This is where positivity comes in. You can always see the positive in anyone. You know, I saw the positive in Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah, he's not me. He's a six yes, foot four, right. bulky, massive. You know, Mister Universe. Yeah. I didn't yeah, want to be yeah. universe, but I saw someone that worked really hard and achieved his goals and was very different for his time. That's enough. That's right. Make me feel yeah. good. So I think um, with role models, whilst they can help if you've got specific goals, take inspiration from wherever. Yeah, well, fantastic. Just, yeah. Answers, aren't I? I'll try and keep them short. Oh no, that was great. No, no, at all, no, at all. I mean, I've probably got about two more questions. Um, um, in terms of um, you know, you say that a lot of people do approach you. You know, what 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 are some of the things that people ask generally? What you know, I'm sure people ask a breath of things. Like I've got a small scar on my neck, and a lot of the time, kids just come and ask me, Derek, what's that? And they don't <laughs> ask it straight away. They don't. Kids have no fear. Yeah. You know, rest yeah. adults who probably sat there like doing giving me one eyes and you know side eyes to try and <laughs> ask, how'd you get that scar on your neck, there, Derek? So I mean, what 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 kind of things do people approach you with? What do they ask you? Oh Christ. Uh, sorry, my language. Let me have that one. Uh, new mum. Uh, so I <laughs> I get so many. I'm smiling, but it literally is. I could write a book on it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the other day, so I'm so I'm literally trying to get some bread and you know normal stuff from the shop. Someone comes up to me, and goes, "Did you know that there's plastic surgeons that can do things for your face?" Wow. And I was like, "Oh no, really." I've been using paper mache and plasters all my life, but thank you so much. Um, but no, uh, so I've had that. I've had um, kids can be cute. I had a girl come up to me the other day and said, you look like a cat. And she was like wow. convinced I was like a cat. And I was like, I, I assure you I'm not. But you know what? Live your best life. I'll be your cat if you want. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so I've had loads of people be say some rude things as well. I don't really mind people asking as long as they're not rude. And I'd rather they ask than sat there staring at me for 20 yeah, solid minutes. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah, it's behind yeah. the question. I find that a lot of people can say some really crazy, weird things. Like a lot of people would say, I've had a lot of people say, are you burnt because the, um, did you get tanned because of the fire? Were you white? Oh. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, that's not how it works. But, <laughs> but um, I always look at the intention, like people on the whole, this is on the whole, yeah. You know, don't intentionally try and do horrible things, you know, or say horrible things. Yeah, Their intention yeah. is they just don't understand, and they don't. It's so different from them. they don't understand what's happening. Yeah, um, yeah. On the whole, I don't mind answering questions, but no, I get a lot of weird things. I can't think yeah, of it. Yeah. I got a lot of weird. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Um, I mean, is there as we kind of come to a close? Um, is there any any final comments you want to leave of those that are watching? The final. I know you've mentioned the five points, which I'll clarify. To conclude but then is there anything that you wanted to you know leave any everyone anyone here with today um, one thing 
Yeah, I would say don't underestimate the power of being kind. I think that's such a big thing and it's kind of underestimated. And kindness isn't, you know, I'm going to affiliate myself to a charity and, mm. you know, and, and do and give them 10 hours a week at work. It's simply smiling at someone in the street. So, for instance, yeah. you just told me about how it feels when people stare at me and what they say. I'll get someone say horrible things or follow me down the road to take a picture of my face and then they're <laughs> friends or do horrible things. And then two seconds later, I'll have someone give me such a lovely smile and that completely yeah. changes there's so much we can do for other people just by the small acts of being kind so as much as there's a lot of difficulty happening in this world right now there is so much good and you can add to that by being kind yeah wonderful Th thank you very much thank um you. So yeah, I, I, I would like to just yeah thank you so much uh, once again for joining us this this uh, afternoon um, um with an incredible story um and i guess this, despite all the the setbacks you had early on in life you chose forgiveness over hate when I know I probably have been very easy to, to choose hate in such a time um, um, when sure. incredible story of of choosing to to love and you know your story has a lot of experience and love in that and you know you shared that with us in in and you kind of see the five points which you left us today to be positive um, and not just as a mood but as a, as a decision um, to be grateful for both the big and the small things in life um, to overcome our challenges both in and out um, to be still and take a pause or relax in those moments before you know you do those actions that we tend to regret um, and to remember the choices we make and to take ownership of that. So I just want to yeah thank you so much for coming and and giving us this reminder of so hopefully some things that we cannot take forward in our day to day in this in this fight against race and discrimination that we can all you know think about others and and yeah make the right choices and decisions that we can share this you know this diversity that we have in a positive way in our day-to-day -day running so yeah thank you very much um, thank, you thank, you very much. And thank you for for listening taking it all in i thank love you. it thank thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> all right thank you so much. guys um the, those of you tuned in today as well thank you for joining us um i hope you have you know, uh, had a good time as, as i did listen to the wonderful story so join us next time for our next event thank you very much